Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for. Um, I wish I, I wish I had counted up which what number of social justice movie nights. This is number this ten. Is, but what is it? Number ten. We did six last year, um, and this is fourth for this year. This so this has been a really a wonderful program that our professional practice, professional nursing practice and advocacy cabinet uh, developed, and it's been really very very interesting and a, a very informative. So I thank you all for being with us tonight for this tenth. Uh, edition of our KNA Social Justice Movie Nights. I'm not sure who we have on tonight. I will take a look at that, but we have had people from all over the country on these uh, movie nights uh, talking about various social justice issues, and this tonight will not disappoint, I'm sure. So um, thank you all so much for being part of this tonight. You will, I'm sure you will enjoy it. Uh, I finished up watching the movie, the generation or the um, Growing Up Poor in America movie an hour or so ago. And um, there's a lot that makes really makes you think about a lot of things. So I think we have a wonderful program with great panelists and programs going on. So I will turn it back over to Delanor. Thank you. Hi, I'm Delanor. I'm the CEO for the Kentucky Nurses Association, the Kentucky Nurses Foundation, and the Kentucky Nurses Action Coalition. And again, I'd like to say welcome. And uh, I would like to introduce our moderator, Judy Mitchell. She is a very active member of the Professional Nursing Practice and Advocacy uh, Cabinet. And she is going to be our moderator for tonight. Judy? Welcome everyone. I hope that you enjoyed uh, watching the social justice movie and we're going to extend uh, our thoughts in this panel discussion now and speak on the topic mainly of food insecurity and how that is related to generational poverty and the um, reality of those two topics in Kentucky. So first off, I would like to introduce our expert panelists tonight. We have a, a wonderful panel for you tonight with uh, lots of experience and expertise in the area of food insecurity. And I'm gonna start off by introducing Michael Halligan. Michael serves as CEO for God's Pantry Food Bank there are nearly 240,000 hungry neighbors who are living with food insecurity across the food banks, central and eastern Kentucky service area. Prior to joining the food bank team, he worked in a number of senior procurement management positions at ConAgra and worked as senior vice president of food sourcing and logistics at Feeding America. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Engineering from Iowa State University. Mike was born and raised in Iowa. Social services and youth fitness are two of his passions. He is a graduate of Leadership Kentucky, a Kentucky Colonel, and a recipient of numerous awards, including the Living Our Values Award from Feeding America, the Crystal Award from ConAgra Foods, and a laureate in equality from the Tech Museum of Innovation. Mike and his wife, Lori, moved to Lexington in 2017, and they are the proud parents of two grown sons and two wonderful granddaughters. So welcome, Mike, uh, to tonight's discussion. Judy, thanks so much for having me tonight. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to a wonderful discussion with y'all and with the audience. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mike. Our next panelist is Dr. Frances Harden Fanning. She is currently a professor of nursing and the Shirley Powers Norton Endowed Chair of Nursing Research at the University of Louisville School of Nursing. Prior to coming to U of L, Dr. Harden Fanning was a nursing professor at the University of Kentucky College of Nursing and retired from UK in 2017. Dr. Fanning, Dr. Harden Fanning's research 
which has been funded by the NIH and philanthropic organizations, focuses on food security issues and healthy eating in at-risk populations. She is on the board of directors for the International Research Society for Nutrition, Education and Behavior and a member of the Midwest Nursing Research Society and Rural Nurses Organization. She is also a former chair of the American Public Health Association Public Health Nursing Policy Committee. Francis teaches in the PhD and DNP programs at the University of Louisville School of Nursing Education. Please welcome Dr. Francis Harden Fanny. Thank you so much, Judy, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. And next we have Kim Hosklaw. Kim is the Managing Director for the Blessings in a Backpack Louisville Chapter and has worked for Blessings since 2014. During that time, she has served as Program Manager for Corporate and Athletic Sponsored Blessings Programs before being promoted to National Program Manager where she helped implement and guide over 300 Blessings programs nationwide. She has served as managing director for the past five years and with support from her advisory board is responsible for raising funds through yearly events, grants and community awareness to support the 6,287 kids fed by the Louisville chapter in 51 JCPS schools. Kim has been married to her husband Todd for 29 years and they have two sons, Jake 25 and Brett 20, and they are adjusting to life as empty nesters. <laughs> Kim enjoys traveling, history, antiquing, interior design, and spending time with her Australian cattle dog, Loco. Welcome, Kim. Well, thank you, Judy. I appreciate it. I feel honored to be a part of this panel tonight, and I'm excited to see where the conversation goes. And next we have Allison Ledford. Allison is the Senior Director of Prevention and Wellness for Norton Healthcare. In her role at Norton Healthcare, she provides leadership for the Norton Prevention and Wellness Service Line the In Good Health Employee Wellness Program, the Adult and Pediatric Prevention and Wellness, and Employer Solutions Strategies. Allison joined North Norton Healthcare in 2009 to develop, launch, and strengthen the organization's wellness program in an effort to have Norton Healthcare become the region's healthiest healthcare system. She holds a Master of Business Administration from Indiana University Southeast, as well as a master's degree in kinesiology with an emphasis in ergonomics and a minor in health promotion from Indiana University. Welcome, Allison. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm excited so we can get this conversation rolling. Okay, so we're going to uh, just go ahead and start right in on, on the questions. And as I mentioned before, the documentary that, um, that the cabinet agreed upon for tonight had to, do with, uh, had to do with poverty in the United States. And also it talked about COVID-19 and how uh, that has affected poverty and food insecurity. So that's where we're gonna to start tonight in our discussion. And um, the, the first question that I wanted to pose to you all, and we'll start with Mike, um, is to help the, help, help the audience understand the similarities and differences between food insecurity and hunger. So can we discuss those two terms and how are they similar and how are they different? Do you have any thoughts on that, Mike? You know, Judy, I do. Oftentimes, food insecurity and hunger are used interchangeably, but they actually mean two slightly different things. Food insecurity is the 
uh, a neighbor, an individual, a family, someone who's living in a situation where they're at risk of being hungry. Often it's uh, financial constraints, transportation constraints. There's a number of different factors that lead into someone being statistically food insecure at risk of being hungry. Hunger is the actual physical pangs of hunger and lack of nutrition in one's system. So you can be food insecure, but not be hungry at a given point in time, or you can actually be hungry, but not food insecure. One example of that is someone who chooses to be hungry because they're on some kind of a diet or some type of, uh, of a fasting for uh, blood work or those kinds of things. Those who are food insecure and hunger, hungry are involuntarily hungry. They don't have a choice. They don't have access to food. They are not able to put food on their table tonight, tomorrow, next week. So one is statistical. One is about the financial risk of potentially being hungry. The other is you actually are experiencing hunger. Very, very important to delineate the difference between uh, food insecurity and hunger. Does anyone have anything else that they would like to add to that uh, topic before we move on. I'll just add that food security is an everyday event uh, and reality for a lot of uh, families and individuals. Hunger, we can we can remedy hunger fairly easy. I can give you a bag of Doritos. I can give you a bologna sandwich. I can give you a salad and remedy that hunger temporarily, but that doesn't really impact the food's insecurity that people experience on a long-term basis. And that that is food insecurity is the element that actually causes all the risks that we're seeing and all the poor health outcomes. Yes, yes, very, very important, yes. And, uh, you know, one, one thing that I would like to add to the, the topics of food insecurity and hunger is uh, the topic of nutrition. So Allison might really like to chime in here. Uh, there is a difference between um, there is an element there uh, to, you know, we can we can hand a child a bag of Doritos, but that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that it's healthy. Um, yeah. So, you know, we we battle in Kentucky the whole concept of food insecurity on in in just about every region, but touching on nutrition is the next level. Am I correct, Allison? Would you like to add to that? Yeah. No, yes, ma'am. So um, so I work for Norton Healthcare, um, and we are large. You might be familiar with uh, we're in Louisville and in southern Indiana. And so when we launched our food pantries, to your point, we wanted things to be healthy, to have that good nutrition. Um, and so and not only that, but then we learned a lot. We learned a lot that you also have to give people we would, would start with pre bagging the, the things they would take home. So we would and it, it helped us. We were more efficient. We could do things early. But what it didn't help was the patient, because if the patient isn't going, doesn't like those types of food, doesn't eat that type of food. We also learned that you have to be um, very cognizant around health equity um, in different ethnicities and different um, people because some people didn't even know how to use a can opener, right? Or they didn't have a can opener. So we'd send them home with canned food and they don't even have a way to open it or prepare the food. So providing recipes, teaching them, asking them what they would like, it um, decreases maybe our efficiency on getting those bags pre-planned, but it helps the patient in the long run because it's actually food they're going to eat, right? So we try to solve that need right there in the hospital, in their visit, and then connect them with community resources, community health workers to solve those other types of things. Like, can they meet them at their house, teach them how to cook, teach them how to use a food, a can opener, and connect them to other resources they may also experience, be experiencing and in need of in addition to their food insecurity. Great point, thank you, Allison. So uh, let's let's go uh, with Dr. Hardin Fanning, and I would like to pose the question um, regarding food insecurity and what does it look like in Kentucky? 
um, you know, what are we seeing in Kentucky and, and what are the specific needs of people who are experiencing food insecurity? And is there a link to poverty? Because statistics show that um, Kentucky ranks high in, I believe we're 45th in uh, food insecurity. And we also are 45th in poverty. So would you um, care to discuss that topic, Dr. Harden Fanning? Sure, absolutely, I'm happy to. Well, we do know that one in eight of Kentucky adults uh, experience food insecurity, and then one in six Kentucky children experience food insecurity. Food insecurity does tend to be influenced by poverty, but surprisingly during the pandemic, um, the Department, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services reported that about half of low income and then 42% of middle income and 32% of upper income houses, at least one member of that family, um, they were unemployed or significantly had wages decreased. So during the pandemic, we saw something that was unprecedented. We actually had people who typically were able to meet their food and nutrition needs for themselves and their families suddenly find themselves in situations where they weren't sure that they were going to be able to do that. I interviewed multiple nurses and nurse practitioners across the state who uh, their jobs were temporarily, if not permanently suspended. Some of them were households that had two practitioners in them. So you can imagine if you, you know, you've been told you'll always have a job, you'll always have a position somewhere, and then suddenly, you know, you're kind of taken out at the knees, you don't have an income. And we know in Kentucky that uh, unemployment benefits were delayed. So several people um, experienced several months of not having income. And those were people who were typically middle class, had other responsibilities as well. So it gave us an insight into the mental health and just the psychological impact of not being able to meet a very basic need and particularly important in childhood because we know that um, living in poverty and experiencing food insecurity, they're at higher risk for obesity because of micronutrient deficiencies. There's a higher risk of child abuse within the home. Academic failure is much higher. Mental health outcomes such as depression and anxiety, both for adults and children, and then just higher overall death rates um, for those who uh, experience food insecurity on a chronic basis. We also know that people who have chronic illnesses, such as diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and mental health, they have poor management of those conditions when they um, experience food insecurity. It's a very overarching um, deficiency in our society when people have to worry on a day-to-day -day basis about being able to eat, just you know, not go buy a new outfit, just be able to eat. Absolutely. It's hard to do anything else when you're when you're concerned about eating. That's, that's a that's a great point. Kim, um, could you expand on that? And can you tell us what you have been seeing with your work in Blessings in a Backpack regarding food insecurity uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic? Sure. Um, prior to COVID, of course, I can only speak on statistics here in Louisville, but prior to COVID, there were 64,000 kids who qualified for blessings in a backpack. And we take any child who qualifies for the federal free and reduced lunch program. So since COVID, that number has now jumped to almost 80,000. And I am getting phone calls on a daily, weekly basis wanting our program, um, telling us that they have kids that want to be in the program that need it and are crying because they don't get it. Um, it's just this heartbreaking. The stories we hear have definitely increased and um, the need is greater than ever, as you know. Mike, how about you? Yeah, so just a couple things to maybe share. The, the sobering piece of the statistics that correlates with um, generational poverty, three of the 10 most food insecure counties in the United States, three of 10 are in Eastern Kentucky. 
12 of the 15 or of the 50, 12 of the 50 most food insecure counties in the United States are in central and eastern Kentucky. We all know what the challenges are with economy and poverty in eastern Kentucky. I think that speaks to a correlation to generational poverty. And I think it also speaks to a daunting statistic when you compare those counties to the entire United States. The other thing that I think is important is when you look at uh, neighbors and neighborhoods where people of color tend to reside, an African-American is three times more likely to be food insecure than someone who is Caucasian. Someone who is Latino, Latina, Latinx, statistically is two and a half to two to two and a half times more likely to be food insecure than someone who is Caucasian. So I think those statistics speak you know, dramatically towards the correlation between poverty and food insecurity and hunger. And I think they also correlate pretty dramatically to the ability or inability to access fresh fruits, vegetables, you know, all of the kinds of products that start to bridge that long-term food insecurity gap um, that we talked about a couple minutes ago. I'm so glad that you added those statistics regarding the counties because uh, it's very ironic. A couple months ago, I ran up on those statistics as well. And that is staggering. Um, I had chills when I heard you speak about that because when you put the numbers uh, out there, it's very staggering. And then in addition to our natural disasters that we have recently been having that will only compound um, those issues. So thank you, Mike, for that information. Um, Allison, we uh, would like to hear from you and your perspective because you have a very unique perspective on the panel because you work at a hospital. So obviously you work at, um, uh, you know, everyone's employed at the hospital, but you still see issues with food insecurity. So can you speak of that? And you can, can you speak of things that you are doing at your hospital at Norton's to combat food insecurity in the population that you serve? Yeah, so one thing that I think is interesting is with COVID-19 is when we really saw a lot of the need really start rising to the top. But what's been interesting with our food pantries is our volume in the month of August was actually high, the highest it's ever been because a lot of the government resources are no longer available to people. And as we're heading into the recession and things are becoming higher priced, so people now more than ever aren't able to afford food. And then when we put these food pantries in, you know, our thought was we, we need to serve the community, right? Um, like Dr. Harden Fanning said, one in five, one in six children are food insecure. So we started with our pediatric offices and then we're talking about screening so we can measure data. We could work with our dare to care partners and our community partners to keep offering support and the more, you know, and building in the social determinants of health questions because we aren't meeting health outcomes because of social determinants of health. People being food insecure is causing even more health outcomes that then we're facing that is then inflating our overall health care across the United States. Then what we realized quickly was that our own employees, like you said, Judy, that are employed, that have jobs, that are, like we say, working poor, they're not poor enough to qualify for the government assistance, but they don't have enough money to feed their family, they needed the food pantries that we were putting in. So as we were serving our patients, we we're also serving our own employees. So now we're taking a step back and realizing how do we drink as we pour to the community? Because we have to stay keeping our own employees food, you know, helping with their food insecurities so that we can keep serving our patients and giving them the best quality of care and be able to provide, you know, bedside at the same time we've lost 20% of our labor force. So it's been very interesting as we're trying to grow and serve the community and realizing we have 18,000 employees that are a huge part of our community and live in a lot of these zip codes. So how do we just do all of it? And there's just not enough resources to meet the need, which is very disheartening. And I know a lot of you feel the same on this call. Judy, can I add a comment to, to what Allison is, is referencing? Absolutely. 
Yeah, in that, you know, there, there are a lot of wonderful agencies throughout all of the Kentucky counties, whether it's Feeding America, God's Pantry, and a lot of work is being done. And we also have local food pantries that are uh, usually sponsored by churches or other groups. And there tends to be, particularly in our uh, more rural counties, there's a bit of stigma that is attached to accepting assistance from those organizations or those agencies. However, we know from the literature that the one source of food assistance that does not carry stigma are those that are housed within healthcare institutions because they're viewed as part of healthcare. So it's really novel what's happening in some of our hospitals because the food pantries are, I mean, the food is being offered to everyone. There's not a, a protocol that you have to uh, go through. There's, you know, there's not a screening process for a lot of them. So it's really a lot of potential for good uh, as far as reducing food insecurity when this is through the medical institutions. That's a fascinating topic to me and uh, that's very inspiring on uh, where we're going in the future uh, and where, where we are now and, and where we're going in the future to try to combat some of these issues. So I think that's, I think that's great. Mike, do you have anything to add? Um, I know that you were quite interested in the topic of health-based food pantries. Uh, is yeah. there any discussion there that you would like to add? Yeah, just a couple of things. So one of the things that's ironic is the vast majority of food pantry and meal programs, at least in our service area, um, don't actually have screening requirements. So it's, it's a self-designated need protocol that most use, and yet you still have the stigma of, I don't want to go to a food pantry, I don't want to go to a soup kitchen because I'm going to be exposing myself, right, to the fact that I need a handout when it's not a handout, it's a hand up, right? We're working really hard to get nutrition into people's lives so they can change their lives. Um, so I think that's kind of an, an interesting um, thing that's out there. Uh, specific to healthcare institutions. One of the things that's really important for all of us to remember is lack of food is a social determinant of health. It's a healthcare crisis. It was a healthcare crisis before the pandemic. It will be a healthcare crisis after the pandemic. One of the things that's coming out of the pandemic is there's more recognition that hunger is in fact a healthcare crisis. For those of you that have been following the, um, the hunger conference that happened in DC uh, for the first time in 50 years, most of the dialogue was around hunger as a healthcare crisis. So being able to work uh, community, uh, being able to work with community healthcare workers to screen those who might be food insecure, to get immediate intervention, working with docs and hospitals and medical centers to think about pharmacy with an F, right? And scripts that help those who are experiencing hunger with the right kinds of foods to better support the efficacy of their treatments quickly starts to close that social determinant of health gap and hopefully gets to a better health outcome. Uh, right now, our food bank is partnering with the VA. We're partnering with uh, several rural hospitals to either have emergency food box programs or pantries actually in those rural hospitals because we're meeting people where they are and we're making it easier, easier and less stigma to the point made a moment ago about getting that food assistance without necessarily having to ask or without necessarily having to make a special trip. And all of those things make it easier for all of us to help those who you know, need that nutrition to get to a better place in life. Judy, can I jump in? So we call our food pantries prescriptive food pantries. It's actually a script written by our provider. It's in Epic. It's actually printed on your after visit summary. Um, and then that referral actually is goes to the, uh, Unite Us, which is our social determinants of health platform that integrates to our Epic EMR. And those referrals are worked. We can time those referrals. I know how long it takes someone to follow up with those, not only around food insecurity, but housing, transportation, different things like that. And then to Mike's point, God love our providers, right? Um, they're doing their job, closing quality care gaps, taking care of their patients. 
So we had to wrap resources around them, one being community health workers, which is a new initiative, that they're actually going to work with patients in the community to go and understand why Allison Ledford isn't coming to her appointment, right? And then calling me, asking those screening questions, because we do screen, we do the hunger vital signs. So we ask the two questions that were truly measuring food insecurity. When Within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out or before we got more money to buy food. So we ask those questions that kind of start that. And then we also, throughout our ED and in our inpatient rooms, we have self-referral QRs. So QR codes. So if someone isn't comfortable talking to our licensed clinical social worker or our community health workers, um, they can self-refer themselves um, as well while they're sitting there for that stigma purpose. So fingers crossed, um, you know, we'll pick up speed and be able to help more people. That's great. Thank you, Allison. And Mike, I really, uh, I really wanted to press on a point that you made uh, regarding this being a health crisis. I believe that it is a health crisis all across the country. And once we start labeling it as such, uh, you know, then we can get the, you know, the word out much easier. Uh, but it certainly is a health crisis right now, not only in our area or our state, but all over the country. So yeah, that was and, a very good point. And Judy, if I can build on that a little for a moment, there's a question in the chat from uh, Lita Marie that asks, can you speak to the overlap in counties which have both f food insecurity and diseases at high rates like diabetes and, and heart disease? And I'm going to use diabetes as the example. Um, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes um, not too long ago, and I've changed my diet to have less carbohydrates, less added sugar, uh, the foods that I am, you know, and I'm, so now I'm eating more expensive foods and I am fortunately in a position to be able to do that. But imagine for a moment, if you're someone who has diabetes and who is food insecure and doesn't have enough economic resource to be able to purchase fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables, to have to purchase carbohydrates, to have to purchase sugary snacks uh, and sodas and, and the things that uh, tend to be a little bit more affordable in the grocery store. Does that help their di diabetes or does it make it worse? The correlations are dramatic. Um, and that's why it's so important for all of us, Blessings in a Backpack and all of these other programs to focus on nutrition and on healthy foods and you know the, the things that help improve health outcomes rather than just being at calories that fill one's stomach because it's not about calories. It's about nutrition. That is an excellent, that's an absolute excellent point because uh, food insecurity and the lack of healthy nutrition uh, just follows right together with all of those issues like heart disease and diabetes. And, um, you know, I have said for a number of years, but now even more so since we're seeing inflation, uh, it's it's expensive to eat healthy. You know, it's it's a it's a big challenge um, among all of us. You know, to try to keep those expenses at a doable rate, uh, but yet still eat healthy. So that's a that's a great great point. Kim. Gee. Can I just tag on to what um, Mike and Allison were saying earlier? Yes, absolutely. Please do. Well, Blessings in a Backpack concentrates on feeding children on the weekend who qualify for the free and reduced lunch program because they depend on the meals at school during the week. But when they go home on the weekend, they may go 65 hours without anything to eat. And... <clears throat> Circling back to what Allison said and feeding them food that they will eat or they are able to eat, and then combining that with um, a price point where you can still encourage people to donate um, so that we can continue feeding food, and then also take into consideration all of the uh, nutritional aspects. So it, it's quite a juggling a uh, job to figure out the menus for the kids that we serve, but we do work with nutritionists to try to develop a menu that um, 
offers the most protein and highest fiber count possible for the dollars that we spend. Um, all of our food is approved for school use, which means if we offer a cereal, it's lower in sugar, higher in fiber than the same brand that you could go buy off the grocery shelf. So it, it really is a juggling act trying to balance all of that criteria. Um, you want the kids to be able to eat the food you send home. You want them to like what they what you send home. Um, so we make sure that all of our products are easy to open. You think about a six-year-old child home alone. Um, can they open this? Does it require the use of an appliance because so many kids are homeless um, or, or don't have working appliances? So everything that we serve is easy to open, doesn't require the use of an appliance to cook and that sort of thing. So those are all important aspects that we have to consider when you're feeding the next generation. Um, because these kids are so vulnerable to uh, the effects of malnutrition. Yes, gonna, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm Can gonna we throw expand? In I'm going to throw in another quick plug real quick, if I could. The other thing yes, that I think is really yes. important for everyone to remember, all of the nutrition programs that are funded by child nutrition reauthorization or by the Farm Bill, the backpack program is not covered in any of those programs. It's all private funding. There is no government funding whatsoever. So imagine for a moment, if the national school lunch program were modified to include weekend meals and backpack programs, how much more powerful that solution for hunger could be. Yeah, it's interesting. Blessings in a Backpack is the only national nonprofit that concentrates feet on feeding kids on the weekend. There's others that have one-off programs, like we mentioned earlier, through churches or food banks. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely a service that's needed. It's a gap that I think a lot of people haven't considered. Yes, absolutely. Can we expand on that, Kim? Um, one thing that Delanor and I both, uh, in doing our research for uh, our food insecurity topic, uh, found is that one of the highest age groups uh, for food insecurity in Kentucky are the elderly. And I know that you serve children. But I am curious to know if you have any statistics or if you have any knowledge on, um, you know, in your area and, and with the population that you serve, how many of those children who are experiencing food insecurity are being raised by grandparents? Um, you know, the, I know that here in Western Kentucky, that's a very, very common thing now. And we even have some families uh, in my small area from where I'm from and their great grandparents are raising the children. So do you have any words that you could speak on that so that we can open up that topic? Um, I don't have any hard statistics on that. However, we've been told several times by family resource counselors at the schools where we have programs that you know, so many of these kids are being raised by grandparents, and it's just difficult for them to make ends meet. Um, I have had grandparents call me wanting to know how they can get their grandchildren in the program, um, and they've expressed that, you know, they're on a limited income, and now that they have the children to help take care of, it's just, it's too much of a strain for them to handle. I wish I had more statistics, but I don't, but that that's what we hear on a regular basis. I don't see a lot of hard statistics about that. Uh, do, do we know of any, do any of you know of any hard statistics on that topic? I, I don't know specific statistics. I think those would be difficult to track uh, yes. because there's really no method in place to track those. But I did quite a few interviews over the past two years during the pandemic and a lot uh, with grandparents who are raising their grandchildren in Eastern Kentucky. And the opioid epidemic is actually fueling another problem related to food insecurity in that the parents who are abusing opioids 
a lot of them qualify for SNAP funds and other assistance, and they they get those, but then they they don't pass those on to the grandparents. So the grandparents don't qualify for SNAP funds, but yet they're having to, you know, meet somehow meet the expense of feeding their grandchildren. So it's causing an additional layer of problem um, with respect to the opioid epidemic in Eastern Kentucky. Absolutely, and we've, we've already just discussed as a cabinet, that may be one of our topics in the near future for our social justice series. It, that is another epidemic in Kentucky, that's for sure, absolutely. Very good. Okay, so what can we, uh, and I'll just throw this out here. I won't ask any specific panelists. I'd like for all of you all to, um, to contribute to this question because it's so important for us as nurses. All of us are natural helpers. Uh, we, we want to help and we want to do uh, and, and make our communities better. So what can nurses in Kentucky do to support healthy communities and combat food insecurity? What can we do? I think the first thing goes along with one of the first questions you asked is what does food insecurity look like? And it, there is no typical presentation of someone who is experiencing food insecurity, particularly related to the pandemic and the lack of employment and other opportunities for advancement. So I think with us in the mindset that anyone who, who we interact with can be someone who is experiencing food insecurity, irrespective of what they look like or what their clothing is or you know their educational background, anyone can experience this. And I think if you're, you know, working bedside or working in a clinical setting, being able to just have that passion to recognize and connect people to resources in their community, um, you know, is critical. And and then I think also investing, right, um, in organizations like Mike's or Ken's that do serve that greater need or even healthcare foundations if they have them to grow those programs. Because, for instance, like ours at Norton Healthcare is completely funded by private donors um, that fund all of our food pantries. And then, you know, we have Dare to Care who donates some in kind, but there's a limit to what how much we can do. So that'd be my two cents. Uh, we have we have a uh, question in the chat and it's from Laura Lane and she's asking how can we eradicate childhood obesity? First let's ask Delanor how long we have tonight because there are so <laughs> many things that go into childhood obesity that that's that's a discussion that's ongoing has been for years but food insecurity is definitely a big contributor to it. What what would be the top top two things that you would come up with, Fran, that we could do as nurses to help eradicate obesity? Well, in my mind, and it's, and it's the broad picture, and you know, again, Dylan, we talk a lot about, you know, what a powerful force nursing is, but it's also one that's not, it's underused. And, you know, legislative policy related to, to food uh, assistance, food supplementation is so important. And I just, I put that in the chat and, and I'll give an example. You know, we had these massive floods in Eastern Kentucky recently and homes were wiped out. It, it's just, it's horrible. Um, and there was food drops that came from the government, from FEMA. And no one was accepting those. They were just sitting around in boxes on people's front porch. And I managed to get a hold of one of those and it was a half a cup of pasta, a strawberry pop tart, two saltine crackers, two packs of grape jelly, and a Tootsie Roll. And there was not a single protein in there. There was nothing that, and I thought, this is why it's not being eaten. Who would, who would drop these foods into this area that's already, you know, food insecure? And this is what they're being offered during this time of absolute loss. So one is really being involved in policy and demanding that, you know, something happen. And then I really think as nurses, just a reduction of the stigma that's associated with asking for help. That is such an incredible barrier, particularly for people who are young adults and young parents. People have a hard time saying, I'm having trouble feeding my child. One, they're afraid you're going to call social services. And two, they feel like they've let their child down somehow. You know, I heard Mike talk about a hand up. What can we do to promote that view that it's not a handout, but it's a hand up? So let me, let me kind of go two ways with that question and with a couple of things that were just said. So legislative support and advocacy. Right now, literally right now, 
there are three bills in Congress with, with joint bills between the House and the Senate that, uh, that are addressed child nutrition reauthorization. The content of those are to take some of the things that we learned during the pandemic on summer EBT cards, right, versus pandemic EBT cards that would improve access to nutrition for kids who are on the national school lunch program who don't have meals during the summer. So expanding the, the eligibility of summer food service programs um, is a critically important opportunity from an advocacy standpoint that leads to better health, health outcomes for children because now the nutrition is year round versus just the nine months in the school year and not the three months in the summer. Those bills also contain a provision to improve categorical eligibility from 40% to 50%. There's a whole bunch of statistics behind that. But basically what it means is it means that more school districts in Kentucky will have more kids that are eligible for free and reduced price lunches, which will help with childhood nutrition. So there's some really amazing things right now from, a, from an advocacy standpoint with childhood hunger that are important. When we get to the next congressional session, there will be the same thing with the farm bill. Specifically to your question about what can nurses do, promote healthy eating. I know you all do that every day. Promote active lifestyles, work with community healthcare workers to do hunger screening to help with immediate intervention. Um, I know you all think about those things. I know you all try to do those things every day. I know that you have patients that listen and I know you have a lot of patients that don't, right? Um, how can we continually message over and over and over again, the importance of nutrition and the importance of asking for help when you need it, because it's not a hand up out, it's a hand up it's helping you with the efficacy of your treatments, you will heal faster with better nutrition. So I know you all do that every day because it's your jobs, right? It's, it's how much you care about your patients. But I think the more that we share that story outside of the profession, the more we help others understand how important that part of your profession is, the sooner we can start to get to some of the things that I've seen in the chat around controls and, and, and lifting up the need and all of those kinds of things. It's such a powerful opportunity. Excellent discussion. Delanor, have you seen any other questions that we uh, need to pose before we- well, I would just like to say that I saw a comment that I thought was pretty potent and it spoke to the history in so many families is to choose the cheaper, high carb, low nutrition versus the healthy options, even when they can access them. Any comments on that? You know, I'll, I'll just say that several years ago, I did a couple of studies and those have been published where we went to uh, throughout the state of Kentucky. And what we found was that the, the more healthy a food is, the more expensive it is in the poor counties. And I'll say that again, that it costs more if you live in a very poor county to access the very same foods that people can buy cheaper in more affluent counties. Uh, it was also, we found that foods that the more healthy the foods are, the, you know, they're, they're expensive proportionally based on the content of health um, attributes to those foods. So it's really tough for people um, who live in a county that's very poor because it's not just the income level is poor, the food is more expensive. Yeah, so let me build on that one if I could for a minute too. And there's a comment in here from Melissa T that kind of speaks to the kinds of foods that are important. Uh, we're working on a program right now, I think it's okay to share this, with Appalachian Regional Health on produce aggregation in Eastern Kentucky. And how can we do a better job and forget about whether it's from a food pantry or a meal program or just more readily available in a grocery store. How can we do a better job of aggregating produce in Eastern Kentucky, working with a healthcare system like Appalachian Regional Health to lower the cost 
of those foods in the community to make them more accessible. And that's a much bigger picture than just feeding those who are, are hungry. That's about changing the food system to balance the economics nationwide and to alter the economics in areas where transportation barriers start to impact costs. Those are the kinds of discussions that we can all have with our administrators and with funders and with all sorts of people where it's not about canned foods, which is how food banking started. That's not what food banking is today. It's about um, the food system and how to make sure the food system is fair to everyone, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of orientation, regardless of address. How can we make sure that the food system is equal to all? And those are much bigger conversations than a food pantry, a meal program, a backpack program, or a food bank. That's food justice and social justice. You know, Mike, there's a comment here that says it's important to be exquisitely clear about the kinds of food donations that would be most beneficial. Many people may not know what is best to donate. Many people are not aware of what healthy foods actually consist of. So I think there are, there's one more comment from Lita. Plus it's harder to get the store for folks who live in Eastern Kentucky and in many places, because I can say that in the West End of Louisville, there aren't many grocery stores that have fresh vegetables and fruits or meats that aren't um, seven or to 10 days old and there's virtually no fish for them. So it is a Kentucky issue that we are addressing. Okay, Judy, did you wanna close up and then I will do my thank yous and we will move on for the evening. Well, I would just personally like to thank everyone for tuning in tonight and especially to our expert yes. panelists. This is, uh, again, such a passion of mine because it's such an issue in Kentucky. And uh, I love that we are speaking of it because I feel like that's the first way that we can implement change and implement improvement. So thank you all so much for taking your evening out uh, to share with us. And um, I, I expect good things from this discussion. Thank you, Judy. I just wanna make one more comment before I speak to what we're gonna be doing for the rest of October uh, with the KNA. And that is, I heard Mike speak about social determinants of health. And I actually heard many of you speak about social determinants of health. But I was in a conference yesterday and one of the speakers said social determinants of health that is the domain of nurses. We own it. What are we gonna do with the people? We own it. So with that said, again, I'm going to say thank you again uh, to all of our experts on the panel. And also I wanna say thank you to those of you who joined us tonight. I know that you could have been doing other things, but we have 47 people to join us tonight and that's pretty darn awesome. We are ending up our, our October and beginning November with some exciting things for the Kentucky Nurses Association. On next Thursday will be our business and awards um, meeting. Um, it's October the 27th from 5 to 7.30. And then we will have our annual conference, People, Purpose, and People, Passion, and Purpose, a World of Opportunities, November the 3rd and 4th. And you may join us at any of those. We would love to have you. Thank you again and good night. <laughs>